All right, good morning, church. Man, wasn't God's presence amazing during worship? Oh, yeah, no, I need a way better yes than that. Come on. I think we get too quiet in church. Listen, we go to football games, we go nuts, and then we come to church and we're like, yes, Lord, yeah. listen to me. He's the only, the only reason why we have a reason to shout, amen? That is Jesus. Well, we are in the second part of this teaching series called First, A New You for a New Year. And we're talking about what does it mean instead of just defaulting to New Year's resolutions or empty promises that often really just reflect our own best efforts and uh, certainly fall short of, of what it is that we really want to accomplish. And I think most of the time, even though our intentions are good, um, those New Year's resolutions begin to fall out of place faster than we even put them into practice. But Jesus says he's got a better way. Come on, say better way. But I want to let you know some good news before we even die in, dive in. Uh, in the month of December, we had our forward Christmas offering. And I've got to tell you that this church is one of the most generous churches I have ever um, really known. And especially even as a church plant, we were a generous church even from day one. Just generosity, the generosity of God just flew in this place. And I'm just so thankful for how good and how faithful God is. And I want to say thank you for being faithful in your giving. I want to say thank you for just being generous people because the truth is when we become more like Jesus, we become generous. Why? Because God is a giver. Amen? And it's important that we understand that. So I want to celebrate just a number. We got the total of what came in for our offering, uh, another 100000 so $125,848 came in. Come on, isn't God good? And... Um, Man, that gives us now a combined total of $456,000. So what does that mean? It means it's an amazing seed for when God says so. And uh, we are actively searching for land. We know that God's got an amazing future for us. We're going to give you an update on how that search is going uh, next Sunday. But we're just believing that the best is yet to come. And if you believe that with me, I want you to high five two people and tell them, I believe it's true. I believe it's true. So Jesus, all right, you got to come back to me now. Here we go. So Jesus... Jesus says, listen, I've got a better way than your efforts, than your best practice, than your best goals on a chart. I've got a better way. Jesus says it this way in Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 31. He says, so do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear for the pagans? Come on, say pagans. And last week I told you that word pagan is an important word because that word represents a non-believer. It represents somebody who is not in Christ Jesus. It represents somebody that does not have trust in a providing God. So here's the truth. If you and I don't believe that God is going to provide, guess what we're going to do? We're going to try to figure it out ourselves. We're going to try to manipulate. We're going to try to force open doors. We're going to get very distracted. Jesus says, do not worry. Why? For the pagans run after all these things. But your heavenly Father already knows what you need. He already knows your need. He knows your need better than you know your need. Amen? Aren't you thankful that God knows what you need? That there isn't a need in your life that is off our Father's radar. He sees where you are. He sees what you need. He's the one who is provider. So Jesus says, here's the trade-off. Instead of chasing after or running after all of these things, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then here it is. Everything you need will be given to you. Jesus says, church, listen up. Every moment of every day, you're going to do one of two things. You're either going to chase things or you're going to seek someone. You're either going to chase after things, chase after growth, chase after results, chase after a better marriage, chase after financial security. You're either going to chase things or instead of chasing things, Jesus says, you can seek me by putting me first in all things. And then when I am first in your life, guess what? Everything you need just begins to fall into place. 
And this is what I've seen. Because listen, if you miss this kingdom principle, guess what? It makes following Jesus really complicated. Because now suddenly, I've got to figure this out. I've got to figure that out. I've got to figure this out. I've got to figure that out. And here's the problem with those efforts. They never yield results. And so we get discouraged. We get frustrated. We start thinking God's not faithful. Listen to me. We begin to blame the one who is faithful to provide for us. Here's the problem. We've been chasing things, not seeking God. So God says, you've got to seek me. Put me first and everything else will fall into place. If you can attest to that, right now is a really good moment to give Jesus your best praise. So I want you to write down what you just affirmed this way. The key to lasting change is putting God first. The key to the change, the breakthrough, the growth that we all long for is putting God first. Above the word putting, I want you to write the word keeping. Because it's one thing to put God first today, it's another thing to keep him first tomorrow. And oftentimes we come to church and we get so excited, why? Because the presence of God is here. Because the word of God is being delivered, Paul says that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So when the word goes forth, we get really excited and we're like, God, I'm going to put you first. And in this moment, we do. And then tomorrow happens. Come on, somebody. Then distractions happen. Then attacks happen. Life happens. And Jesus says, here's what I need you to know. It's one thing to put me first right now in this moment. It's another thing to put me first tomorrow when it ultimately matters. And so the key to lasting change, not temporal change, it's one thing to experience some breakthrough for a few days, but isn't it true that we fall back into that breakthrough? That we go right back, that is our nature, to return to what is familiar even when we know it's not good for us. So Jesus says, no, 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 no. You gotta put me first and then you've gotta keep me first and when I am first in your life, everything else falls into place. Last week we talked about we've gotta put God first in our relationships. We've gotta make sure that God is first in our relationships because our relationships will either take us to God or keep us from him. You've gotta understand that. You will never run the right way surrounded by the wrong people. As believers, you have to come into agreement with God on that. If you missed that message, you can go back. Today, I want to talk about this next big one, God first in our finances. And this is a really important one, just like last week, because if there is another thing the enemy will use from keeping us from putting Jesus first in our lives, it is the area of our finances. I read this this week. Little Johnny asked his father, Daddy, How much does it cost to get married? Johnny's father replied, I don't know, Johnny. I'm still paying for it. Come on, somebody. That's funny right there. Listen, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12 and Malachi chapter 3. Mark chapter 12, Malachi chapter 3. And we're going to look at these two passages of scripture and we're gonna see what does the Bible say about our finances. Now the truth is, if you've never heard me teach on finances before, I believe that you're gonna receive some revelation today. And if you have heard this message before, I still believe you will receive some revelation because God began to show me some new things this year. And this is what I love about God. You could read the same passage 20 times and the Holy Spirit is gonna continue to unveil new revelation from his word. Amen? Because it's living and active. So we are a Bible church. If you don't have a Bible, if you say, Pastor Sean, I can't turn there. I don't have one. We have free copies of the Bible at the Welcome Hub. We would love to give you one. Just go and grab it after service. You can grab it now if you want to. But we are a Bible church. We love the word of God. If you're with me, shout out amen. Okay, listen, I need you guys to wake up today. I need you to be excited today. I need you to holler back like you love Jesus today and you love the word of God today, amen? All right, here's the deal. You gotta write this first thing down. God notices when he is first. God actually pays attention. Like the order matters. When you and I put God first, he actually notices. Now look at Mark chapter 12, starting in verse 41. Now Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put, and he noticed this. He watched. I mean, he's looking. He's 
paying attention to the crowd as they put their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, notice this 42, but a poor widow came and she put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. And calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all of the others combined. Verse 44, they all gave out of their wealth. Notice this, they all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything. Come on, say everything. She put everything she had to live on. Why would she put everything she had to live on into the treasury? Here's why. Because she understood that her security is not found in money. Her security is found in Jesus. And some of us spend much too much time focused on what is in the bank account instead of the one who can do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine. So you've got to get this. Jesus is watching this activity and people are bringing their tithe to the local storehouse. So they are coming and they're dropping it off. And Jesus says he's noticing there are all of these rich people, really, really rich people, and they're just kind of chucking in big amounts. It doesn't move the heart of God. But then comes this widow Two cents. And he goes and she drops that money into the treasury and something in Jesus' heart takes notice. He steps back and goes, disciples, get over here. I need you to see something. I need you to learn something about finances. I need you to understand something about my economy. You see all those rich people? Let me tell you what, that widow, she gave way more. Way more than all of those rich people. But that's not how the world would measure it. The world would measure it. No, 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 no. It's the richest person who gave the most money. That's the big offering. Jesus says, that's not my economy. Because Jesus is not interested in us bringing him money. Jesus is interested in us surrendering ourselves fully to him. And you can bring a lot of money to God and never move the heart of God because he was never after your money. And I want you to write down these four things that we learn from this text. The first one, tithing is more about the order than the percent. God is saying, I want to know where I place in your life. I, I want to know, am I first? I, I want to know if you're going to put other things before me. The purpose of tithing, it is more about the order than it is about the percent. Our earthly minds, our callous minds, our, 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 uh, our earthly way of thinking always gravitates towards the amount. And God is saying, no, 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 I'm trying to get you to stop thinking that way. It's not so much about the amount, it is about the order. Where do I place in your life? I can feel the tension in this room and I'm thankful for it in Jesus' name. Because God's about to set some people free today. Do you believe it? Here's the second thing. Tithing takes faith to put to, uh, in God's promise to provide. Tithing takes faith in God's promise to provide. Here's the deal. God says, I want you to give me the first. I don't want you to go pay your bills and see if there's any left over. Why? Because that doesn't take faith. No, 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 no. I want you to give me the first and trust that whatever you need to survive, I will provide because I am Jehovah Jireh. See, see, that's why giving should be sacrificial. It should force you to have to trust God. God said, no, 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 no. I don't want to just be first, but I want to be first in a way that it causes you to have to lean into me. It causes you to have to press in so hard to the promise that I will always take care of you. I need a better amen. Here's the third one. Tithing reminds us that we are stewards, not owners. Oh, can I get a better amen? Come on, listen to me. We live in the land of I own it. It's mine. God says, no, 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 no. If you have it, it's because of me. Whether you know it or not, you have your job because of me. 
Whether you know it or not, you have a savings because of me. Listen, God is the God that opens doors that no man can open. He closes doors that no man can shut. You would not have that job had he not given you the favor to get it. Because when you don't have a job, who do you pray to? So we intuitively know. Right, but don't we do this? It's mine. It's mine. God says it's not yours. All things were created by me, and they were created for me. So I've put it in your hand, not so you can own it. I've put it in your hand so you can be a good steward. So tithing reminds us, man, I don't own it. I, I, I don't even own my future. I don't even own today. I don't own myself. I was bought with a price. Can I get a better amen? Here, here's the fourth one. Tithing is ultimately about joyful generosity. It's about joyful generosity. I want to ask you a question. If you are a Christian, you have put your faith in Jesus Christ. You have said, Jesus, I will follow you with all of my life. Don't answer out loud. I just want you to ask this question. Am I becoming generous? Because here's what happens. The closer I get to God, the more I become generous. When I first came to Christ and I went to Bible college, I was not a generous person. I did not know these things. Then I met this lady right here on the front row, and she drove me crazy because she was so generous, and it would irritate me. She'd be like, I think we should give this. I'm like, I think we shouldn't. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Stop it. Stop it. We'll do other things. We're not going to give that. Listen, God had to teach me. Here's the truth. If I want to become like Jesus, truly become like Jesus, I need to become a generous person. It's not about the percent, it's about generosity. I just met with a pastor yesterday, two days ago and he told me, Pastor Sean, he said, I don't say this to boast. He said, I, I say this to just be honest with you. We don't bring 10% to God. For the last 15 years, we have brought him 30%. Not because we have to, because we get to. Because it's about generosity. It is about the heart. Look at this, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 through 7. Now I say this, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. But he who sows bountifully, come on, say it, bountifully, bountifully. will also reap bountifully. Each one, listen, each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart. Not grudgingly, come on somebody. Listen to me, look at me, look at me. If you bring your tithe to the Lord with a bad attitude, he will not receive it. Which should prove to you he's not after your money. He's never had a need in his life. He's not going, oh man, I wish Vertical Chapel would step into this month's giving because I'm a little bit low. <laughs> Listen, he, he's never had that. Th he's not after your money. Listen, not, not under compulsion, for God loves, here it is, a cheerful giver. A cheerful giver. Miss Johnson was a widow. And she didn't have much money, but she had a steady job. And uh, she really didn't have many extras. She had enough just to get by, but she loved Jesus. And she would declare how faithful Jesus is. She would declare that he is Jehovah Jireh, that he takes care of all my needs. And anybody that she would meet, she would ask, do you know Jesus? He is such a good provider. He is such a good, faithful God. Now, the owner of the apartment complex in which she lived, he was an atheist. And he couldn't stand Miss Johnson because Miss Johnson would always talk about how good God is. And she would always tell him, God will provide. Whatever my need is, God will provide. So she goes to work one day and she gets the news that they are having layoffs. And she loses her job and she comes home and she tells somebody in the hallway, I just lost my job. Now the owner of the apartment complex overhears this and goes, ha, 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 I got you. Look, you go and you worship God. You talk about how good and how faithful he is, that he's Jehovah Jireh, that he provides for all of your needs. But look, he can't even give you a stable job. And then he says this. You better take your eyes off of Jesus and you better go get it done 
for yourself. And she says, I maybe don't have groceries in my fridge. There might be no extras in my pantry, but I'm telling you, God will provide for all of my needs and he'll give me another job. So the next morning, she goes out to look for a job. And so the owner of the apartment complex goes, I'm gonna go to H-E-B and I'm gonna spend $300 worth of groceries and I'm gonna pack her fridge and I'm gonna pack her pantry and when she gets home, I'm gonna prove to her that God does not provide that you've gotta do it in your own strength. So she comes back to that apartment just praising God. He is so good. He is so good. And she opens up the door to her apartment. She goes into her room. And the guy who owns the apartment goes and listens real carefully, trying to hear what's going on on the other side of the room. And then Mrs. Johnson opens up her fridge and goes, Woo! My God did it again. He provided for all my needs. He is Jehovah Jireh. And all of a sudden you heard... And she opens up the door and he goes, aha, I told you that God doesn't provide you up here praising Jesus like he's Jehovah Jireh. I'm the one who gave those groceries to you. You should be praising me and not him. He goes, I will never, she goes, I will never praise you. I will always praise him. He goes, I'm the one who gave you those groceries. And she said, no, uh my Jesus gave me those groceries. He just used a fool to pay for it. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Come on, that'll preach right there. I want you to write this down. God is not after your wallet. He's after your heart. God is not after your wallet. He is after your heart. He notices what you choose to put first in your life. And when you put God first, come on, he's looking at a bunch of widows going, they gave everything. They gave everything. They're trusting my faithfulness. They're trusting that I'll provide for all of their needs. Here's the second thing. God blesses when he is first. Come on, there's one thing for God to notice. It's another thing for God to bless. I need a better amen. Look at Malachi chapter 3, verse 10 through 11. Bring the whole tithe to me. Come on, say tithe. No, 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 no. Say it like you mean it, like you're excited to be in church and you love Jesus Christ. Come on. Bring the whole tithe into the local storehouse. Storehouse represents the local church. Bring the whole tithe into the local church that there may be food in my house. Now let me tell you the spiritual application of that so that there might be opportunity for people who do not know Jesus Christ to get a spiritual feeding and call upon the name of Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, amen? So that ministry can happen, so that marriages can be restored, so that people can get saved, so that kids can know Jesus Christ, so that parents can be raised up in truth. In other words, bring your tithe into the local church so so that ministry can happen. Notice this next word, test. What? Do you realize this is the only place in Scripture where God invites us to put him to the test? He says, test me in this. Woo, come on, say, he's going to preach now. Come on, somebody. He says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Can I tell you why there won't be room enough to store it? Here it is, because it's not all for you. The reason why you will not have room to store it because God has already marked it with another purpose. He's saying, I've entrusted it to you to pass through your hands into somebody who desperately needs it. This is why the local church should be known for generosity. God doesn't give us just enough. God gives us more than enough and then he asks us to operate in the overflow of that. I will rebuke. I will rebuke the devourer for you. 
I won't just bless. Here's the result of my blessing. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil. And your vine will be filled and will not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. God says, vertical chapel, I want you to test me in this. I want you to put me first in the area of your finances and see if I do not fling open the gates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there is an overflow for you to operate in. But I won't just pour out blessing. Then I'm going to rebuke the devourer. Now we've got to address the first word, which is tithe. Come on, say tithe. High five three people and say, it's time to get real. Come on, tell them, it's time to get real. Come on, say it like you mean it. It's time to get real. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, sorry. Ten. All right, here we go. Ten. Tithe means tenth. That's literally what it means. So God says, here's the deal. I'm going to entrust you with resources. There's ten bananas. He says, here's what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to bring me the first 10%. And then all of this you can manage as I lead you. But bring me the first 10%. Come on, say one banana. How many do we have left? We have nine. Here's what I need you to understand, and this is why I believe there has been faulty teaching in the church. We bring God, how many? One banana, and then we have nine. We don't have nine. God still owns it. And I think often what we do is we say, I'll bring 10, fine, I get to do what I want with the rest. And God does want you to be able to enjoy. It's not wrong to have things, it's wrong when things have you. So it's okay to have things. But God says, now I need you to be a good steward. But here's my promise to you. When you put me first in the area of your finances, he says, see if I don't just fling open <laughs> the gates of heaven and see if there isn't so much blessing. You didn't think you'd see that in church today, did you? Come on, somebody. Listen. You don't even have room to store it. Now, I could sit up here and give you personal examples how God has proven this true to Elise and I. I could tell you that God repeatedly gives us testimony of this from people who called this place home. Who said, Pastor Sean, I listened to your message and we decided to put God first and God poured out blessing. Listen to me, you can never outgive God. You can never outgive God. He says, Look, when you put me first, I will pour out blessing. But let me tell you the benefit of the blessing. See, because God says, I want you to test me. But what I really need you to understand, he's not asking you to test him just simply so that you know he's faithful. Because giving you blessing isn't always the deepest picture of his faithfulness. He does not just say, put me first. I'll pour out so much blessing that you don't have room enough to store it. Then he says, and I will rebuke the devourer. And this is the result of his blessing. Here's what you've got to see. See, the devourer in the natural were crop-eating pests. So a farmer would take all the money that he had and he would sow that seed. And so his income was based on on that seed producing a harvest, but these natural pests would come along and they would eat up all of the harvest. And so God says, here's the deal. I will see to it in the natural that these crop-eating pests will not have the authority to destroy that crop. I will put a hedge of protection around. Let's do it in the spiritual now. 
When we put God in the area of our finances, he puts a spiritual hedge of protection around us. It's called the blood of Jesus. Come on, somebody. And here's my point. Because we all say, man, if I just had more money, if I just got that promotion, if I just had that house, here's the question. What good is increase if the enemy still has access to destroy it? God says, I'll bring the increase, but with the increase comes my protection. And with my protection enables you, empowers you to steward what it is that I placed in your hands. Listen, write this down. Satan can't destroy what we place in God's hands. Young people, I want you to understand the power of the bless, the power of the tithe, the blessing of the tithe. I want you to begin to realize that as you make money, that money is not your money. That money belongs to God. And God says, he who sows sparingly, he who doesn't develop a generous heart, he will reap sparingly. But he who becomes generous, he says, I will pour out blessing. And there are a lot of Christians that do this, and I did it for a while. I gave God 10%, I'm good. And God goes, no, 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 I was never after the money. I was after you. And when I get you, guess what? You become a good steward. You become generous. You stop living above your means. Look what Martin Luther says. I've held many things in my hands, and I have lost them all. But whatever I have placed in God's hands, that I still possess. Come on, that is good. See, I get it. Because sometimes you hear a message like this, and you're like, it's, yeah, that's great, Pastor. But I'm so in debt. <laughs> like, I can't afford to tithe. Can I just tell you? You can't afford not to tithe. And I also need you to understand that I wrote into the bylaws of this church, I do not know who gives what. So don't get nervous like, is he checking my giving records? He's talking to me. Listen, if you're convicted, that's the Holy Ghost. Come on, somebody. Look, I, I, I don't know who gives what. It's not my business. It's between you and God. I'm here to tell you that God's not after your money. He's after you. And when he gets you, he doesn't just get your wallet. He gets every area of your life. And I want you to know that he's a faithful God. He's good in all of his ways. Pastor Sean, that's great, but I don't even know how to get out of debt. I'm so broken. I'm gonna encourage you with something. Financial Peace University. Well, I've tried it before, but did you finish? I already went through it, but are you doing? I want you to go ahead and check out this clip. The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is slave to the lender. Are you really going to make the hard choices to change your life? We had 40000 in student loans, uh -huh. 17000 in cars. I owned a rental property. We in had a line of credit, just stuff. We had 16 credit cards. The proverb says, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but when desire comes. We paid off $83,000. Wow! When desire comes. $144,000. When desire comes. $450,000 in the last seven years. Wow! It is the tree of life. God says this is how you get out of debt. You gotta run, 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 run. There is no doubt that this process called Financial Peace University works. The only question is whether you're gonna be involved. And so if you haven't signed up yet, now is the time. There is a new round of financial peace that's going to be starting. And I want to encourage you, if you're living under the suffocation of debt and you feel like there is no hope, listen to me, the number one cause to divorce is finances. God created us for financial freedom. He created us for financial peace. And I want to let you know that the last class that went through this, this is what they did. In nine weeks, these people paid off over $131,000 in debt. They saved almost $30,000, and they closed 52 credit cards at Vertical Chapel. Come on. All right, write it down. Healthy finances are a byproduct of healthy choices. 
See, we all want financial peace. We often just don't want to make the hard decisions that make it possible. And I want you to know this is what God said to me. You will never see a change in your finances until you make a change in your lifestyle. It's not about just doing some things and you can continue with bad spending habits. Here's the last and final one. God multiplies when he is first. He notices when he's first. He blesses when he's first. And he multiplies when when he's first. Proverbs chapter 3, 9 through 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then, come on, say then. It's a conditional statement. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with Notice this next word, new, new wine. You know, sometimes we get so stuck, we don't think it's even possible for God to do something new. I believe that in this new year, God wants to do something new in the area of your finances. He wants to do something new in the area of your life. I want you right now, if you're in agreement and you can attest to the faithfulness of God's word, his promises, and Jehovah Jireh. Right now, give him praise to encourage those. Here's how I want to word it. God calls us to do what we can. And then we let God do what we can. God says, do what you can, make the hard decisions. So how do we wrap up all of this that we've talked about today? Because it's a mouthful. Three things, write it down. Number one, start with what you have. Can I just encourage you, stop making excuses. Stop making excuses. I can't afford to. I've got too many things. Listen, just start with what you have. God is faithful. Start with the seed that he's already put in your hand. Number two, trust God alone to provide. Here's what I want to say. Some of us, here's what we do. We trust that God will provide, but we have other options just in case. Can I tell you, get rid of the other options because Jesus is the only option. And you might be able to acquire material things without him, but they will never lead to eternal blessing. This is why Jesus says, what would it profit a man to gain the world but to lose his soul? Trust him. He is provider. Here's the last thing. Do whatever it takes. Stop the insanity. Come on, look to your neighbor and say, stop the insanity. You know the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over, expecting different results. God says, if you want a new year in your finances, then you've got to make decisions that you haven't been willing to make before. But Pastor Sean, what if they tell me to sell my car? They might. What if we got to stop spending all this money on that? You probably do. Come on, somebody. But when God is first, everything else falls into place. Every head bow, every eye close. This is what I feel led to pray for today. I'm not here to embarrass you. I'm not going to ask you to run forward. But if finances have become one of those things that just seem to be suffocating you, and you've been worried about them, you've been under a spirit of fear, and you're ready to say, And this is the year that I put God first in this area of my life. I'm going to start with what I have and I'm going to trust him alone to provide and I'm going to do whatever he asks me to do. If that's you, I'm just going to close in prayer. I'm not going to call you out. But if you have been under the pressure of finances and debt and maybe you're not sure about your future and, and how it's all going to... Listen, if that has been an overwhelming thing to you, just in the privacy of this moment, would you just slip up your hand and say, Pastor, this message was for me. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, 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 yes. I want you to keep your hand up and I'm gonna pray. And I want you to come into agreement with the Lord. Say, Father, 
I put you first in the area of my finances. I know that I can't fix it. I need your blessing. I need your protection. I need your favor. I repent from putting myself in this place. And I'm asking for your grace. I'm asking for your help. And I thank you. Come on, tell them. I thank you that all things are possible through Christ who gives me strength. Come on, say that last part again so you believe it. I thank you that all things are possible through Christ who gives me strength. Lord, I put you first in Jesus' name. And all God's people shout it out. Can we give Jesus some praise? Stand to your feet. We're going to worship, and we'll have our altar team at the front. If you need prayer for anything, whether it's financial, area of your health, marriage, maybe something, a doctor's appointment, whatever it might be, if you need prayer for anything, during this last song as we worship God together, you feel free to come. God bless you.